How does it feel to finally be the president? Nobody's ambition is what the blood of any Nigerian. I intend to keep my oath and serve as president to all Nigerians. After four attempts, Muhammadu Buhari was now in the hot seat. His victory at the polls, riding on the goodwill of the people, not only transformed him from candidate to president after 12 years of relentless pursuit, but also gave Nigerians a new hope something to believe in. I belong to everybody and I belong to nobody. You could feel the optimism in the air. It was a new dawn. Change had come at last and Nigeria was set to get better. Well, no, this is not one of those stories. In the months preceding the elections that brought Muhammad Bari to power, the popular chant on the streets was The months that followed his inauguration, however, shocked Nigerians. The Nigerians will know the difference. In his inaugural speech, the president stated that his administration would focus on the economy, fight against corruption and insecurity. Upon resumption of office in May 2015, Mr. Buhari got to work on his many promises. He quickly relocated the military command from Abuja to Maiduguri. That is the birthplace of Boko Haram. He improved the military budget and approved the purchase of arms for the security forces and agencies. Keeping with his promise to also end corruption, Mr. Buhari began a probe into the use of military funds under the previous administration of President Goodluck Jonathan. He ordered the arrest and prosecution of former National Security Advisor Sambo Dasuki over alleged corruption. This anti-corruption effort was important for the relationship he was trying to build with the West. With work ongoing on that front, he embarked on a trip to the United States to meet former President Barack Obama, seeking support for Nigeria's anti-terrorism efforts. He also visited neighboring countries, including Chad, Niger, and Cameroon, to build alliances against Boko Haram. The president was working hard to fight terrorism and corruption just as he had assured Nigerians during his campaign. And this is where our story begins. In the following chapters of this documentary, I want to show you what Buhari did with Nigeria's security, economy, health, and above all, his famous anti-corruption crusades. This is not exhaustive, of course, but I promise you there's a lot to wrap your head around on the topic of Muhammad Buhari's eight years in office. First, let's talk about the anti-corruption war. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has arranged a suspended Accountant General of the Federation. The trial of the former National Security Advisor. One of Muhammad Buhari's campaign messages, in fact, the strongest of them all, was that he would fight corruption head on. This was great news for Nigerians, especially because the administration of Goodluck Jonathan watched corruption grow in all arms of government without lifting a finger. So, Having the incorruptible Buhari come in to clean up the mess gave everyone a reason to smile and hope for a better Nigeria. But how did Buhari perform in his anti-corruption fight? Well, on the one hand, he prosecuted high-profile politicians, civil servants and retired military officers for corruption and secured convictions in a handful of cases. His administration also recovered billions of naira in stolen assets from corrupt officials. In fact, in recognition of his great efforts in the fight against corruption, President Muhammad Buhari was unanimously endorsed as anti-corruption champion in the fight against corruption in the African Union in 2017. This endorsement was done by African leaders. And in 2018, he was again named African anti-corruption champion by this same African Union. However, as the popular saying goes, the devil is in the details. According to Transparency International, Nigeria under Muhammadu Buhari was among the countries where corruption actually got worse. In its 2021 report, Nigeria scored 24 out of 100 points. Since President Muhammadu Buhari was sworn in as president in 2015, Nigeria had steadily dropped in corruption ranking. Take for example, in 2015, Nigeria ranked 136th Again, 136 in 2016, 148 in 2017, 144 in 2018, 146 in 2019, and by 2020, Nigeria ranked 149th in the world. So, how exactly did Buhari fight this corruption that happened to get worse 
under his administration. Buhari's anti-corruption war was endorsed by the President of the United States, Barack Obama, with the United States Secretary of State at the time, John Kerry, praising Buhari's efforts at the World Economic Forum held at Davos in Switzerland. In October 2015, the United Kingdom joined the United States in pledging her support for Buhari's anti-corruption war. With international support secured then, Buhari went about arresting people from the opposition party. Several senior officials in the administration of former President Goodluck Jonathan were arrested and faced prosecution by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, our good friends, the EFCC. However, the EFCC was not spared of the corruption they fought against. In fact, accusations of mismanagement and embezzlement of funds recovered from people convicted of this said corruption led to the replacement of Ibrahim Lamoudi as EFCC chairman on November 9, 2015. His replacement would be Ibrahim Mustafa Mago, who would face a similar fate before the end of Buhari's administration. Buhari's anti-corruption efforts were marred by the perception that they were selective and targeted mostly at members of the main opposition party, that is the People's Democratic Party. Under President Muhammadu Buhari, a politician's crimes could be forgiven if they decide to join the All Progressive Party. In one instance, the EFCC left the courts with their tails between their legs when Buhari's administration decided to terminate the 25 billion naira fraud trial of a former governor of Gombe State, Danju Magoji. According to Premium Times, the EFCC withdrew from the matter after Mr. Goje agreed to step down for Ahmed Lawan as Senate President. Talk about quid pro quo, yeah? Well, Mr. Malami, who was the Attorney General at the time, would later justify the decision in an interview, claiming that his action was in the public's interest. In another instance, Mr. Malami withdrew the prosecution of a military officer, Nicholas Ashinze, a former aide to Mr. Dasuki, that is the ex NSA to President Jonathan, whose case Muhammad Bari used as his anti corruption campaign poster. You see, this Dasuki case, even though it generated a lot of media attention at the time, hasn't really gotten anywhere. The $2 billion arms deal was exposed following the interim report of Buhari's investigation committee on arms procurement under the Good Luck Jonathan administration. The investigative report indicated that a total sum of $2.2 billion was sent to the office of the National Security Advisor for the procurement of arms to fight against insurgency. But this money was not spent for the purpose for which the money was disbursed. Investigations into this illegal deal led to the arrest of Sambo Nasuki the former National Security Advisor, who later mentioned prominent Nigerians involved in the deal. Well, I made a whole documentary on that in this video linked right up here. Is it here or here? Well, you'll find it in one of the spaces. Yeah. During Buhari's eight years in office, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission failed to record any high-profile convictions of serving politicians. Many cases against former governors and ministers remain pending others dismissed without justifiable explanation to the Nigerian people. Some ex-governors who were indicted are now serving as senators. In order to enable all of us to enjoy our holidays, a token has been sent to our various accounts. And that is not all. While Buhari was going after officials of Good Luck Jonathan's administration, his own government was being accused of similar practices, or worse. Like in 2016, Buhari was reportedly presented with evidence that his chief of staff, Abakari, took a 500 million naira bribe from MTN to help it slash a $5 billion fine slammed against it for violation of Nigeria telecommunications regulations, a violation that greatly impacted negatively on national security. MTN allegedly fired the staff involved in this bribery scandal, but Abakari was left intact in his position as chief of staff. The national outrage that followed that decision forced Muhammad Buhari to later announce a probe of Kiari. However, just like many probes of high-ranking political office holders, the findings of that investigation were never made public. Even though the scandal was widely reported in the media, 
the late Abakiari never offered an explanation to the Nigerian people as well. Well, the president didn't mind keeping Kiari on either. I mean, why should he? When there were others just like Kiari trying to keep him in office. Here's what I mean. In 2018, it was revealed that some politicians who were working tirelessly for the re-election of President Muhammadu Buhari had corruption cases hanging on their necks. One of them is Abdullahi Adamo, who was the governor of Nasrawa State between 1999 and 2007. And he also served as national chairman of the All Progressive Congress during the 2023 general elections. He was also a member of the National Advisory Committee for the Buhari 2019 Presidential Support Committee. He was at one point charged with allegedly stealing 15 billion naira from Nasrawa State when he was the state governor. The People's Democratic Party, which is the main opposition party now, raised this issue of the corruption charge against Abdullahi Adamu when he was set to become the chairman of the APC. However, the presidency replied and said he has repented. Yeah, but this was nothing new to Nigerians. Under the government of Muhammadu Buhari, the country had repentant terrorists and political criminals. You may think I'm overblowing things out of proportion, but here's a report on this same Adamu. In 2018, the Northern Senators Forum removed Senator Abdullah Adamu as chairman of the Forum for Alleged Financial Mismanagement and Maladministration. A spokesperson for the group alleged that the main reason for Adamu's removal was that monkeys, that is, this animal right here, cutted away 70 million naira under Adamu's watch. That 70 million naira was money gathered from the 7th Senate and handed over to Northern Senators of the 8th Senate. The monkeys were accused of raiding the farmhouse of some of the executives of the Northern Senators Forum and ran away with the money. Well, while Nigerians focused their attention on snakes and monkeys going after millions, the Buhari administration failed to deal with termites in government and this lapse in judgment would cost the country dearly. On August 14, 2022, it was reported that some termites trying to escape poverty decided to storm the storeroom of the Nigerian Social Insurance Trust Fund and ate up vouchers totaling 17.128 billion naira. The money represents the documents of transfers from the NSITF accounts in its Sky and First Bank accounts untraceable accounts belonging to individuals and companies from January to December 2013. The Senate Committee on Public Accounts discovered it when it interrogated the NSITF management. The managing director of NSITF told the committee that the vouchers and other financial documents that could help in tracking down this 17.128 billion naira were stored in a container that had not only been beaten by rains over the years, but also eaten up by termites. But before this termite story, there was another major corruption scandal with Buhari's officials. In May 2022, the Accountant General of Nigeria, Ahmed Idris, was arrested for money laundry and diversion of public funds. This Accountant General was said to have committed fraud by corruptly manipulating the Treasury single account, Government Integrated Financial Management Information System, and the Integrated Payroll and Personnel Information System to steal billions of Naira. By December 2022, the ASCC would disclose that it had recovered 30 billion Naira from the suspended Accountant General, Ahmed Idris. The amounts diverted was alleged to be around 109 billion naira. I know you're wondering, where does it end? The fight against corruption, did it yield any result or did it lead to more looting of the national treasury? Well, this last instance will give you a clue. The whistleblower has accused the suspended governor of CBN, Godwin Amefele, of being involved in an alleged stamp duty fraud. On October 26, 2022, Godwin Amefele, the CBN governor under Muhammadu Buhari, announced the CBN's plan to redesign and circulate a new series of three banknotes out of the existing eight. 
They redesigned notes where 200 Naira, 500 Naira, and 1000 Naira notes. And they were due for circulation on December 15, 2022. Mefeli said the pre existing notes would remain legal tender until January 31st, 2023. This would be the first time in almost 20 years that Nigeria will redesign its currency. The CBN governor explained that this decision was reached due to persisting concerns with the management of currency in circulation, particularly those outside the banking system. MFLA had also said that the decision was in line with the provisions of the CBN Act of 2007 adding that the management of the bank had sought and obtained the approval of President Muhammadu Buhari to redesign, produce, release and circulate a new series of banknotes. Trouble began, however, when on October 28, Zainab Ahmed, Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, said the CBN did not consult the ministry on the policy. She said the change of the series of banknotes would bring about serious consequences for the economy adding that such decisions require rigorous economic planning. The drama got more serious when, two days later, on October 30th, as though responding to the finance minister, President Muhammadu Buhari said the CBN had his backing to redesign the Naira notes. Buhari also said famously that politicians would not be allowed to mobilize resources and thugs to intimidate voters in the 2023 general election. The statement some believed was meant to halt the corrupt buying of votes during the election. Well, Nigerians would later learn that this was all a farce. On November 23rd, Buhari unveiled redesigned Naira notes before the Federal Executive Council meeting at the State House in Abuja. The redesigned notes presented to the public were the 1000 Naira, 500 Naira, and 200 Naira, respectively. But the old notes remained legal tender. On January 29, 2023, CBN extended the deadline for the swap of old Naira notes to February 10th, giving a seven-day extra grace period for direct deposit with the CBN. And then it started with the announcement that the old notes were to cease being legal tender in the coming days. Cash scarcity hit the nation. This led to people selling Naira in Nigeria to Nigerian citizens. A crisis that led to devastating scenes all around the country. And then, the lawsuits began to roll in. The time period for its implementation. The CBN governor have in the past shown absolute disrespect for these hollow chambers. I believe the CBN deceived the president. By February 3rd, 2023, Kaduna, Kogi and Zamfara states sued the federal government over the Naira redesign policy. Buhari asked Nigerians to give him seven days to resolve the Naira notes crisis and accused banks of greed. By February 6th, the FCT High Court restrained the CBN from extending the deadline on the use of old Naira notes. Two days later, February 8th, the Supreme Court restrained the CBN from enforcing the February 10th deadline following an ex parte application brought by the states. The Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, filed a preliminary objection challenging the court's jurisdiction to entertain the matter, asking the Supreme Court to dismiss a suit filed by these three state governments challenging the narrow redesign policy of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Well, CBN insisted on the February 10th deadline for old notes validity, despite Supreme Court ex parte order. By February 15th, the Supreme Court adjourned the case against the CBN to February 22nd, ruling that old notes remain legal tender. Well, amidst all this drama and the back and forth turning Nigeria's highest court into a comic center, Nigerians didn't know that Governor Emefiele was literally fighting for his own survival. The special investigator on the CBN and related entities, Jim Obazi, has accused MFLA of unlawfully lodging billions of Naira in at least 593 bank accounts across the United States, United Kingdom, and China. These transactions reportedly occurred without the necessary approvals from the CBN Board of Directors and the CBN Investment Committee. The report also reveals that 
MFLA contracted the redesign project to De La Rue of the UK for £205,000 after the Nigerian Security Printing and Minting PLC expressed its inability to deliver within the required time frame. The investigation further exposes that 61.5 billion naira was earmarked for the printing of new notes, with 31.79 billion naira already paid. The report further claimed that MFLA also manipulated the ways and means of the CBN with the alleged help of his four deputy governors. It further exposes the creation of a fictional presidential subsidy and an expansion of the ways and means portfolio to accommodate financial irregularities. Documents reportedly reveal instances where senior CBN and government officials padded approved amounts leading to an alleged misappropriation of funds. So, while fighting corruption and jailing political opponents, his CBN governor was allegedly running a huge fraud right under his nose. The question is, was Buhari aware? Or was he so ignorant that he didn't know about all these illegal dealings? That would say a lot about a commander-in-chief who claimed the African Union's anti-corruption champion twice, don't you think? In reality, Buhari not only lost his anti-corruption war, the Nigerian economy was in shambles during his eight years in office. It turns out economies are not built on anti-corruption wars alone. But don't take my word for it. Let's take a look, sorry, a look at Buhari's economy and how his administration performed in that regard. In the first year of Muhammad Buhari's presidency, the Nigerian Naira depreciated in the black market, leading to a vast difference between the official exchange rate and the black market rate. The Naira was fixed at 197 to the US dollar at the time he took office. But the black market rate quickly soared to 370 naira to a dollar just months after Buhari's inauguration. Before his election, Buhari had promised that he would make the naira equal to the US dollar in value. This must have been playing in his head when he refused all calls to devalue the naira. His refusal didn't help the Nigerian economy. Instead, it led to a severe foreign currency shortage in the first year of his administration. Also, the wide difference between the official rates and the black market rates opened up the opportunity for well-connected individuals to buy dollars at the official rate and sell at black market rates, making a mockery of the president's anti-corruption image. Despite his campaign promises to improve the value of the Naira, the exchange rate rose from 197 Naira at the official rate to 745 Naira at the parallel market in 2023. Prior to 2015, Nigeria's inflation rate remained at single digits. Some analysts at the time still claimed this was high. For instance, in the whole of 2014, Nigeria's rate of inflation moved between 7.7%, which was the lowest, to the highest point of 8.5%. By 2015, when Buhari took over, the inflation rate averaged 9%. By the time he left office in 2023, Buhari had helped prop up Nigeria's inflation to a record 22%. Well, in all fairness to Buhari, he had to deal with less income from oil. The final months of Good Luck Jonathan saw oil prices tank from $111 per barrel to $54 per barrel by late 2014. With Jonathan spending lots of money to defend the Naira, Nigeria's foreign reserves were getting depleted. The then presidential candidate Muhammad Buhari and his team made it a campaign slogan, showing good luck's inherent weakness in handling the economy. The optimism with which Buhari spoke about the Naira to dollar value made most Nigerians believe that General Muhammad Buhari had some magic wand to use in fixing the economy. But when he got to the office, Buhari realized that spectators sometimes only think they know more than the players on the field because they are mostly watching from the sidelines. The first blow to Nigeria's economy saw oil prices fall from their highs, reaching $40 per barrel in December of 2015. 
Also, disruptions started to emerge from the Niger Delta pipeline bombings by militants that led to a halt in production. With Nigeria unable to meet up with its quota, the Buhari government struggled with both prices and quantity deliveries. While it was expected that the Buhari administration would quickly rise up, you know what I mean, to stem the weakening economy, he didn't apply urgency. Instead, he was busy touring the world. Yeah, for someone that spent 12 years trying to become president, you would think he came ready. But no, Buhari took six months to name his first cabinet. Well, let's cut him some slack. He was just taking his time to get it right, I suppose. Now, in order not to bore you with lots of figures and economic terms, we will keep things simple by going over Nigeria's inflation and the country's foreign debt profile under Muhammad Buhari. Muhammad Buhari's administration between 2015 and 2023 led Nigeria into two recessions. Inflation figures hit an 18-year record high of 22.22% and the country's debt profile rose to more than $150 billion, more than three times the debt left by the previous government. This report is according to the Debt Management Office. The Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, NBS, said the economy grew by an average of 1.4% under Buhari's administration. Well, talking about inflation, in 2015, a bag of rice was sold at 8,000 naira. I know this may sound like a myth to most of you now, but yeah, it was true. At the time, a liter of petrol was 87 naira. As of May 22, 2023, a bag of rice rose to 40,000 naira, while a liter of fuel sold for more than 200 naira. Yeah, and you know, the figures are ridiculously higher now, but hey, let's talk about Buhari today. Tinubu will surely get his chance to shine, maybe sometime in the future. On power generation, as of 2015, Nigeria was generating 4,949 megawatts. But during Buhari's time, it dropped to 2,409.50 megawatts. According to the Association of Power Generation Companies, the national grid collapsed a record 98 times under Muhammadu Buhari. But that is not the worst part. Despite spending over 1 trillion naira on social spending, Buhari left 133 million Nigerians in multidimensional poverty by the time he left office. Buhari's legacy with regard to the economy is that of infinite borrowing and little output. But how could he have had any meaningful output when he spent over 200 days in foreign hospitals as he embarked on endless medical tourism. Yeah, this brings us to Buhari's contribution to the health sector of Nigeria. The administration of President Muhammadu Buhari met a decaying healthcare sector after his election in 2015. And most Nigerians honestly believed his government would help fix the sector. The emergence of COVID-19 further re-echoed the necessity for prioritizing the Nigerian healthcare sector. But despite spending 2.3 trillion naira on the healthcare budget during his administration, he left it worse than when he came into power. This was evident by the fact that the president was always embarking on medical trips abroad as it appeared as though he didn't trust Nigerian doctors and hospitals to handle whatever it is he was dealing with. And oh, oh yeah, he dealt with a lot. For example, in May 2016, Buhari cancelled a two-day visit to Lagos to inaugurate projects in the state, opting to send his vice president Yemi Oshimanjo instead. This emergency cancellation was after citing an ear infection. He spent six days in London between February 5th and 10th, 2016. On 6th of June, Buhari again traveled to the United Kingdom to seek medical attention. He traveled for 10 days to England, seeking further treatment for the same ear infection. The president extended his trip by three days before coming back on June 19th, 2016. This happened days after the presidential spokesperson, Femi Adesina, was quoted as saying Buhari was, quote, as fit as Fido and hale and hearty. Well, by January 19, 2017, the hale and hearty Buhari wrote to the Nigerian Senate, disclosing his intention to travel abroad on a 10-day vacation 
and that he would hand over power to Vice President Yemi Oshimbanjo. In February 2017, following what was described as routine medical checkups in the UK, Buhari asked the National Assembly to extend his medical leave to await test results. His office did not give any further details on his health condition, nor the expected date of his return. On 8th of February 2017, President Buhari personally signed a letter addressed to the President of the Senate alerting him of a further extension to his annual leave, leaving his Vice President in charge. Following an absence of 51 days from office, Buhari returned to Nigeria. Speculations about Buhari's health circulated on social media in the following days after he expressed his desire to work from home. I mean, this was ridiculous as it seemed as if he was turning Nigeria's highest office to a remote job. Some prominent Nigerian figures urged the president to take a long-term medical leave, citing his failure to make any public appearances over a two-week period. On 7th of May 2017, President Buhari again left Nigeria for a reported health checkup in London. This time, he stayed away for about 104 days, all these trips to see foreign medical doctors, all while Nigerian doctors embarked on strikes over poor working conditions and pay disputes. Yeah, during Buhari's administration, data from the World Bank showed that despite its vast development needs, Nigeria spent only $220, about 101,000 Naira at the time, per Nigerian, per year. This was one of the lowest levels of spending in the entire world. No fewer than 75,000 Nigerian nurses and midwives relocated abroad in five years, and 11,273 doctors relocated to the United Kingdom under President Muhammadu Buhari's watch. In 2021 alone, about 13,609 Nigerian healthcare professionals were granted working visas in the UK. The infant mortality rate under Buhari's final year in office was 54.74 deaths per 1,000 life births. While UNICEF stated that Nigeria records 576 maternal mortality per 100,000 life births, one of the highest in the world. Also, Nigeria, according to the 2021 World Malaria Report, accounts for the highest number of malaria-related deaths in the world. Of the 619,000 persons killed by malaria in 2021, Nigeria accounted for 31.3%. Strikes by doctors and other health workers working in federal government-managed hospitals resulted in the loss of more than 153 working days between 2015 and 2023. According to Datafight research, the strike embarked upon by the joint health sector unions between April 17th and May 31st, 2018 was the worst since the country's return to democracy. This strike lasted for 44 days and affected the entire nation. While the other strikes were mostly at the federal level, state and local government's health workers joined this particular strike at some point. This crippled the entire nation's health services as all government health facilities were shut down. But instead of negotiating in good faith with these health workers to resolve their grievances, the Buhari's administration used court injunctions to order the call-off of strikes. When COVID-19 hit, the Nigerian health sector was stretched to its limit. Massive resources were mobilized nationally and globally to address both what was a health crisis and its economic side effects. For instance, Nigeria received $3.4 billion in emergency support to address the COVID-19 pandemic from the International Monetary Fund. Furthermore, a total of $6 billion was raised by other donors as complementary support to the Nigerian government. The World Bank approved an additional $400 million credit as additional financing to support vaccine acquisition. Official sources said that 2.6 million households received 20,000 Naira each between January and April 2020 under the Conditional Cash Transfer Program. But the details of how the billions of Naira donated under the Nigerian Private Sector Relief Fund against COVID-19 was spent remain foggy and unaccounted for. The government claimed it 
had distributed 100 billion naira to conditional cash transfer recipients in just one week. They reportedly used some registers that Nigerians know nothing about. But how many people actually got these palliatives? Due to the lockdown, the federal government under the Ministry of Humanitarian and Disaster Management and Social Development on the 1st of April 2020 announced the provisions of food items to vulnerable Nigerians across the 36 states of the Federation. And it was officially reported that over 50 billion naira was spent to share food items to most affected people. Also, the CBN gave stimulus packages to different sectors of the economy affected by the pandemic. The package was 50 billion naira in credit facilities to support households as well as small and medium enterprises. However, surfing through media reports, I saw how the disbursement of these 50 billion naira COVID loans to small businesses was negatively affected by a lack of transparency and some inefficiency. The Nigerian government claimed that it paid 5 billion naira worth of palliatives to the transport sector is still surrounded by lots of controversy till date. In damaging reports, Civil society organizations like Budget revealed how palliatives meant for the public were hijacked by politicians and distributed only among party loyalists. The Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission ICPC, confirmed discrepancies and infractions in the procurement and payments made by government agencies after the disbursement of these COVID-19 funds. These were donations that would have helped improve people's lives during the COVID emergency. It will interest you to know that even in the experience COVID gave to us, the government is yet to build an emergency response system that can withstand another such outbreak should it happen again. But if you think these failures of the Buhari's administration were the worst, think again. This is where I remind you that the Buhari's administration's failures in the security sector successfully turned banditry into a lucrative business in Nigeria. While Boko Haram was the only major threat at the time Buhari came on board, Nigeria witnessed the birth of other terrorist groups during his administration. It was during the Buhari's administration that the killer headsmen were born. We had bandits and now kidnappers. Sometimes we had the unknown gunmen. And the activities of all these groups led to the death of thousands under Buhari's watch. But aside from the terror organizations, the Nigerian military was unhinged in some of its dealings with civilians. Like in December 2015, when the Nigerian army launched an attack on members of the country's Shia community, killing hundreds of people. The military claimed that the Shia Muslims attempted to assassinate former chief of army staff, Tuku Boratai, when the incident occurred. This claim has been strongly rejected by the Islamic movement in Nigeria and several human rights organizations who argued that the massacre occurred without any provocation and that all the protesters were unarmed. The incident is considered among notable human rights violations since the return to democracy in Nigeria, a record that will be broken five years later in 2020 under the watch of the same Muhammadu Buhari and by the same Nigerian military. Well, let's leave it alone if you know what I mean. In Buhari's first year in office, at least 55 people were killed in two Boko Haram raids near Meduguri, the Borono state capital. In the same year, 21 people were also killed in Takum Taraba state. Boko Haram and the bandit conflict have been responsible for numerous serious attacks with thousands of casualties since the mid-2010. According to the Council of Foreign Relations Nigerian Security Tracker, over 41,600 lives have been lost to this conflict as of October 2022. The United Nations Refugee Agency counts about 1.8 million internally displaced persons and about 200,000 Nigerian refugees in neighboring countries. But this was why Nigerians voted for Buhari in 2015, right? His campaign famously declared that Osibanjo would handle economy while Buhari would take on security. 
as a former military general. So how did the general fight this battle of insecurity in the country? Well, let me give you a few details. In February 2015, the Boko Haram affected states agreed to establish an 8,700 strong multinational joint task force to jointly fight against Boko Haram. This was after the conflict in the northeast between the militant group Boko Haram and Nigeria's security forces grew more deadly. By the beginning of the year 2015, Boko Haram had seized control of 17 local government areas across parts of the northeast in Adamawa, Bauchi, Borono, and Yobe states. But thanks to the multinational joint task force, by October 2015, Boko Haram had been driven out of all the cities it controlled and almost all of the northeastern parts of Nigeria. However, Boko Haram was not the only security threat faced by the Buhari administration. The Niger Delta saw intense attacks on oil infrastructure in 2016 by militant groups such as the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta. And then we have the Niger Delta People's Volunteer Force. We had the Ijo National Congress and then the Pan-Niger Delta Forum. In response, the new Buhari government pursued a dual strategy of repression and negotiation. In late 2016, the Nigerian federal government resorted to the gambit of offering the militant groups a 4.5 billion naira, that is 144 million US dollars contract to guard oil infrastructure in the region. Most of them accepted this deal. The contract was renewed in August 2022 but led to fierce disputes among these groups over the distribution of the funds. Insecurity in the Niger Delta meant the Nigerian oil pipelines in the region were largely unguarded. This resulted in unprecedented levels of oil theft not witnessed in history. And then there is the sacking of villages and communities by herders in what some have called systemic ethnic cleansing of the Middle Belt region of the country. This is still happening by the way. It all started, or should I say, got more serious under Muhammadu Buhari. On February 29, 2016, hundreds of people were brutally murdered in what is now known as the Agatu Massacre. This attack led to the displacement of thousands. It is believed that the attack was committed in retaliation for the killing of the Fulanese cows. The community and other small villages in Benue State still witness attacks like this from time to time till date. Nimbo is a border town in Uzo Uwani area of Enugu State, Nigeria. In the early hours of April 25th, 2016, seven villages in this border town were invaded and dozens were massacred by over 500 armed Fulani headsmen. The headsmen who reportedly were hell-bent on occupying a portion of the farming community's land for cattle grazing plotted an attack and went on to notify the natives about their invasion on April 23, 2016. This intelligence was promptly reported to security agencies who reportedly met to discuss this. However, at about 5.15 am on April 25, 2016, the armed headsmen numbering close to 500 or more struck these villages, killing 40 people in the process. The following day on April 26, 2016, six more bodies were recovered and 14 victims were lying critically ill at Royal Cross Hospital in Suka and other neighboring hospitals. During the raid, a church known as Christ Holy Church International and 11 houses were reportedly burned down by these herders. As a result of the insecurity, Displaced natives fled to neighboring communities in fear of further attacks. Then there was the invasion of Upabi Nimbo community in what is now known as the Enugu Massacre, still by roaming Fulani headsmen. But who are these people carrying out these attacks? Boko Haram was already technically defeated at this point. So who was this other group? The Middle Belt region of Nigeria has been vulnerable to clashes between farmers and cattle herders, two groups trying to secure arable land for grazing and farming, and access to water. The intensity and politicization of the conflict along ethnic and religious divides increased during the administration of Buhari. The conflict between farmers, many of whom are largely Christians, 
and headers who are predominantly Muslims has also stoked religious tension. The situation was made worse when the president sent in military troops to disarm ethnic Christian militias while reportedly ignoring armed cattle headers. The administration's effort to solve the conflict led to the National Livestock Transformation Plan to modernize cattle grazing and stabilize the Middle Belt region. In 2017, a controversial solution called RUGA, an acronym for Rural Grazing Area, but also a word meaning settlement in Fulani, was proposed. The Bari administration introduced the controversial RUGA policy aimed at resolving the conflict between nomadic Fulani headsmen and these farming communities. The policy, which is currently suspended, would create reserved communities where headers will live, grow, and tend their cattle, produce milk, and undertake other activities associated with the cattle business without having to move around in search of grazing lands for their cows. The policy was developed by the National Livestock Transformation Plan under the Nigerian Economic Council to curb the conflict between farmers and Fulani herdsmen. Southerners believed the policy was designed to benefit the Fulanis. So, some Southerners and some religious bodies kicked against the Ruga policy. This led to its suspension by the government. But this suspension came after some Arewa youths under the ages of the Coalition of Northern Groups, CNG, reportedly gave Southern leaders 30 days to accept the Ruga project in peace and a 30-day ultimatum to President Muhammadu Buhari to implement the program with the Ruga debate heating up. On January 6, 2017, Arewa gave the Igbos living in the north a quick notice to leave the region before October 1, 2017. The Coalition of Northern Youth Groups warned that if Igbos failed to leave by the specified date, they would use force to evict them all. The group also threatened to take over all the landed properties of the Igbos after they had left the region. The notice was given in response to the pro-Biafra agitation and the sit-at-home protest that took place in the southeast on May 30, 2017. All this to a deafening silence from the president. Oh, he wasn't entirely silent. He sent the military to show the agitators who's boss. With insecurity becoming a national concern, the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tuku Burutai, announced the launch of an exercise in the Southeast Geopolitical Zone, codenamed Operation Python Dance 2, which would last from September 15th to October 15, 2017, in the five Southeast states of Abia, Anambra, Ebony, Enugu, and Imo states. Buratai said the objective of the exercise was to effectively contain the reported cases of kidnapping and other vices prevalent in the Southeast region every Yuletide season, coming at a time when tension was already mounting following the renewed activities of the pro-Biafra agitators and the threat by the federal government to revive the suit against the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Ipo, that is this guy, Mazi Namdikanu. Various interpretations were already being given to the latest move by the army. While some said it was part of the alleged intimidation of the people of the Southeast following the demand of the agitators for a referendum for the actualization of the Biafran Republic, others alleged that it is in line with the policy of the APC-controlled federal government to continue to keep the Southeast region on edge. Well, in preparation for the commencement of this operation, the army decided to position men and equipment at strategic positions in some of the towns in the zone. The presence of such equipment and soldiers was said to have triggered the clash between the Nigerian soldiers and IPOB members in Umwahia, during which some people sustained diverse degrees of injuries. Though the Nigerian army announced that the exercise was aimed at fighting crime in the area, the indigenous people of Biafra IPOB, in a statement signed by its director of media and publicity, urged the chief of army staff, General Tuku Buratai, to take back the armored tanks being assembled in Biafra land to the war fronts in the north where the tanks were needed because, according to him, IPOB was not fighting any war in the east. You see, 
the story of Buhari's legacy in the southeast region of Nigeria deserves its own video. Maybe we'll get to it someday. I don't know. There were other incidents of insecurity throughout Buhari's administration. Like in 2018, when the Nigerian military suffered its highest number of fatalities against Boko Haram. The group captured a large cache of military hardware and was responsible for the death of at least 600 Nigerian soldiers. In the same year, it attacked nine military bases and overran the multinational joint task force base in Baga, Borno State. In July 2018, the Nigerian army suffered heavy casualties as Boko Haram killed 62 personnel in an attack on a military base in Gaidam local government area of Yobe State. Abductions, suicide bombings and attacks on civilian targets by Boko Haram persisted all through 2018, with at least 1,200 people getting killed and nearly 200,000 being displaced in the northeast alone. While Buhari used the Chibok girl situation to run down the Good Luck Jonathan administration during his campaign for the 2015 presidential elections, his own school girl's abduction took place in February of 2018. On February 19, 2018, at about 5.30 pm, 110 school girls aged between 11 to 19 years were reportedly kidnapped by the Boko Haram terrorist group from the Government Girls Science and Technical College, Dapchi, which is located in Bulaboli in Busari local government area of Yobe State in the northeastern part of Nigeria. The Federal Government of Nigeria deployed the Nigerian Air Force and other security agencies to search for the missing girls and to hopefully enable their return. The governor of Yobe State, Ibrahim Gaidam, blamed the Nigerian army for having removed a military checkpoint from the town five of the schoolgirls reportedly died on the same day of their kidnapping. But in a surprising move, Boko Haram released everyone else in March 2018, holding back the lone Christian girl, Leah Sharibo, who reportedly refused to convert to Islam. As the country's attention was focused on the insecurity situation in the northeastern states, tragedy struck yet again on the 4th of March 2018 in Benue State as suspected headsmen unleashed terror on their victims, leaving 26 people, including women and children, dead. According to XBM intelligence, kidnappings in Nigeria increased radically under Muhammadu Buhari. Between June 2011 and the end of March 2020, at least $18 million was paid to kidnappers as ransom. By July of 2022, Attempts were made to impeach Muhammadu Buhari over the insecurity situation in the country. But his party came to his rescue as usual. Senators of the opposition People's Democratic Party staged a walkout after a move to commence impeachment proceedings against President Muhammadu Buhari was blocked by Senate President Ahmad Lawan. His final year didn't see any improvements either. In April of 2023, the Kaduna state government disclosed that Bandits killed 1,266 persons in 15 months in the state. Also, 746 persons were kidnapped in the state between January and March 2023. In Plateau State, gunmen killed around 30 people in May of 2023 alone. Nowhere was safe for Nigerians under the reign of Muhammadu Buhari. In fact, over 289 people were killed in worship centers within 18 months during Buhari's tenure. The rate of attacks on worship centers leading to death was brought to the fore with the attack on St. Francis Catholic Church Owo on those days on June 5th, 2022. I can still remember seeing images of dead bodies scattered everywhere in the church. No fewer than 40 worshippers died that day. Well, rather than strive to protect Nigerians from the mayhem, the administration of Muhammadu Buhari embraced many scandals than I can possibly cover in one YouTube video. One of the notable ones was his relationship with the judiciary. The Buhari administration reportedly ignored more than 40 different court judgments that it considered hostile to its political agenda. 
Some of the most important among these include the refusal of the state security services to comply with four successive orders of various courts, including the ECOWAS court that granted bail to former National Security Advisor Sambo Dasuki. It was a similar situation in the case of Omoyele Showore, an online publisher arrested in 2019 over allegations that he wanted to overthrow the Buhari government. Despite a court order that freed him on bail, he was not released until he spent 134 days in detention. Even in broad daylight, SSS invaded the court while in session to rearrest him after he had been granted bail. The same pattern occurred in the case of Sheikh El Zazaki, the head of this Islamic movement in Nigeria. El Zazaki was in police custody between 2015 and July 2021 when he was eventually acquitted by a trial court. Under his watch, the SSS became notorious for disobeying court orders and he did not at any point publicly condemn the security operatives for disobeying the court orders. As if disobeying court orders were not bad enough, the incorruptible Buhari watched government agencies and politicians pad budgets embarrassingly. The 2016 budget has been steeped in controversy after several reports revealed an inflated allocation of funds and multi-billion naira phony subjects smuggled into the budget. A federal high court sitting in Lagos in a landmark judgment ordered President Muhammadu Buhari to urgently instruct security and anti-corruption agencies to forward to him reports of their investigations into allegations of padding and stealing some 481 billion naira from the 2016 budget alone by some principal officers of the National Assembly. And then there were the human rights violations that were rife under Buhari. For example, on August 17th, 112 women were arrested and prosecuted in Oweri Imo State for protesting the disappearance of IPOB leader Namdi Kano. They were discharged and released by a court six days later. But the biggest scandal of Buhari's administration came in 2020. This would turn out to be one of the worst legacies of the Muhammadu Buhari's administration. Now, there is no argument at this point that the Nigerian police have a notorious history of brutality and disrespect for the rule of law. For many years, its officers have been accused of disregarding the human rights of accused persons, violently suppressing protest, infringing on fundamental human rights and corruption. In fact, it is widely believed that with the Nigerian police, Suspects are guilty until proven innocent. But the brutality by the police was taken to a whole new level by the rogue unit known as SAS, the Special Anti-Robbery Squad. SAS was originally established in 1992 to combat armed robbery and other violent crimes. However, over the years, the unit became notorious for its high-handed tactics, including arbitrary arrest, torture, and extrajudicial killings. The unit's actions were often targeted at young people, particularly in urban areas, who were perceived to be criminals based on their appearance or lifestyle. All of this led to the famous NSAS protests against the activities of the operatives of this rogue police unit. NSAS was a decentralized social movement and series of mass protests against police brutality in Nigeria. The slogan calls for the disbanding of this special anti-robbery squad, SAS, but the movement took a whole new turn when on Saturday 3rd of October 2020, a video showing a SAS police officer shooting a young Nigerian in front of West Town Hotel, Ikeja, Lagos State, trended on the internet. It was alleged that the police officers took away the young man's vehicle, a Lexus SUV. The trending video caused public outcry on social media, especially on Twitter, with the NSAS hashtag trending everywhere. Just as the NSAS trend began on Twitter, on Monday 5th, October 2020, another report surfaced of SAS officers killing a 20-year-old upcoming musician named Daniel Chibuike, popularly called Sleek in his neighborhood. Sleek was said to be sitting in front of a hotel with a friend when the SAS officers approached them. 
prompting them to flee. According to an eyewitness, the SARS men pursued the pair shouting thief before shooting Slick as they ran through a supermarket. His friend was reportedly arrested in the process. By Thursday, the 8th of October 2020, Nigerian youths had had enough. Nationwide protests on NSAS started after weeks of outrage and anger with videos and pictures showing police brutality against young Nigerians. With videos and pictures showing police brutality, harassment and extortion in Nigeria. The protests were led predominantly by young Nigerians in different cities alongside many activists and celebrities. Nigerian police force, in its usual brutal spirit, disrupted the protests in some cities, throwing tear gas, using water cannons, and shooting at unarmed peaceful protesters as seen in Abuja and Oshun State. By Wednesday, 14th October 2020, the NSAS protests were still ongoing, with young people in different parts of Nigeria intensifying their calls for reforms and accountability in police operations. As the protests engulfed the entire nation, some hoodlums attempted to hijack the protests that had been peaceful up until this point. On the 19th of October 2020, President Muhammadu Buhari reacted to the continuation of the movement by warning young Nigerians of anarchists who were allegedly attempting to hijack the protest and stated that the federal government, quote, would not tolerate anarchy in the country, end of quote. This was shocking to the young Nigerians who were yet to be addressed by their beloved president on these their grievances of police brutality and the many other calls for better governance. Rather, here was the president issuing threats to the people. The next day, the Nigerian government would follow through with its threats to the protesters. On the 20th day of October 2020, the Nigerian army deployed men of the armed forces to the popular Leki toll gate, where a large number of these protesters were gathered, carrying out a peaceful protest. This would be the scene of Nigerian's version of China's Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989. The day began just like every other. Many turned out as usual, some not knowing that it would be their last. Following violent escalations, which included attacks by agitators against both protesters and police, the governor of Lagos State, Babajide Sangwolu, declared a statewide 24-hour curfew effective 4 p.m. West African time on the 20th of October. During this time, images of some pressings alleged to be working with the state government and the Lekki Concession Company, removing cameras at the toll gate circulated on X, and then street lights at the toll gate vicinity were turned off. A few hours later, it was reported that armed men of the Nigerian army started arriving at the scene of the protest. So minutes later, shots were fired. The Nigerian army opened fire on peaceful and unarmed protesters. But amidst all of this, the question we are yet to find answers to is, who gave that order?